Hello there. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event. My name is Paul Heaton. I'm the academic director of the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Cary Law School. The Quattrone Center is a multidisciplinary center focused on preventing errors in the criminal justice system. So an important part of our mission is to draw attention to research and scholarship that can promote a fairer and more accurate resolution of criminal cases. To that end, we're delighted to have an opportunity today to highlight an important new book that was recently released, Autopsy of a Crime Lab, Exposing the Flaws in Forensics. I'm just gonna take a moment uh, to introduce our three distinguished uh, panelists. First, it's a real pleasure to welcome back Brandon Garrett, uh, the L. Neal Williams Professor of Law at Duke University and founder and director of the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at Duke. Uh, Brandon also currently serves as the court appointed monitor for the federal misdemeanor bail reform consent decree in Harris County, Texas, and is on the leadership team for the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Science, CSAFE. Uh, he's a prolific scholar and author of six books and his work has been cited by courts and legislators, including the US uh, Supreme Court. Brandon is joined by Dr. E.T.L. Dror, a uh, senior researcher at University College London and principal consultant and researcher for Cognitive Consultants International, a world-renowned authority in the field of expert decision-making and bias. E.T.L. has published over 120 peer-reviewed scientific articles and done foundational work on judgment and bias of forensic examiners. He also regularly serves as a court expert and provides training to judges and lawyers on expert bias. We're also uh, delighted to welcome Menka Sinha, an assistant professor at the University of Maryland Carey School of Law and director of Maryland Carey's Criminal Defense Clinic. Prior to joining the law school, Menka spent 10 years at the renowned Public Defender Service of DC where she served as senior advisor to the agency's director on forensic science issues, led the agency's nationally recognized forensic practice group and represented indigent clients charged with serious crimes, including complex homicides and sexual assaults. Uh, so before we get into our discussion, uh, just a reminder, if you're seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that CLE codes will be announced twice during the event. Write the codes down, enter them on your digital evaluation form. Uh, the form is mandatory to receive CLE credits and you should have gotten a link in the, your confirmation email and we'll also post a link in the chat. Uh, so the first of the two codes is responsibility, uh, the word uh, responsibility. Uh, all right, so uh, you know, let's uh, turn the time over to you, Brandon. A wonderful book. Tell us more about it. Sure, I like that we have a magic word for today's event. Well, it's great. To, it's great to see you, Paul, and thank you, everyone, and John, and everyone at the, the Quattro Center that made this possible. And uh, it's not as much fun as the last time I wrote a book when I got to be there in person, but. Uh, but ETL, maybe you wouldn't have been able to fly all the way from the UK if we've been doing this in person. And and thank you, Minica. And it's just great to, to be here with both of you. Um, I wanted to say a few things about what motivated the book and give everyone a little quick tour of it. But I really wanted to hear from ETL and Minica to talk about all the different dimensions to this problem. And if there's anything I wanted the book to do, it was, it, it's that um, is to convey the idea that behind something seemingly as simple as a fingerprint match or a firearms comparison. There are like 12 different ways uh, that the analysis can and sometimes does go wrong. And it's not something I fully appreciated. Even when I was studying forensic errors in the well-known cases of people who had been exonerated by DNA. And early on in my career, that was what I was focused on. I had represented DNA exonerees. I represented someone who was convicted based on a uh, faulty bite mark testimony. I represented uh, the exonerated five who there, there was people didn't focus on it so much but in the central park case there was both hair and soil comparison and so you know i'd certainly seen early on even before i became an academic cases where experts overstated evidence and really reached totally wrong conclusions in cases of people who are flat out innocent um but my, my focus was on what they said on the stand and on their testimony and on overstatement and how they 
exceeded the boundaries of science, how they made errors and gave misimpressions to the jury. But over, over time, as, as I looked into these questions, and, and certainly with the benefit of ETL's work and others, um, have a greater appreciation now for there are, there are accuracy challenges and serious problems with these disciplines, not just in whether they have scientific foundations, whether they are reliable, even if done well, not just with how good a particular expert is, not just with whether an expert can be biased by all sorts of cognitive factors, but there are quality and scientific validity issues at every step of the game, from the moment someone touches evidence at a crime scene, to the laboratory, to the courtroom. And that, that kind of picture of all the different ways it can go wrong and how poorly regulated the whole system is and how little there is in the way of treating crime labs like real labs, like clinical labs, that, that's, that's the goal of the book. I think all of us have a much greater appreciation during these difficult times uh, of the fact that false negatives, false positives, like the accuracy of testing really matters. We're all, we all, you know, we're all um, hopefully able to take advantage before too long if we haven't already of vaccines. We've all watched how the vaccines have been tested. Uh, some of us have been COVID tested at different times during the past year. We know some things about which tests are more reliable than others. And we know that, uh, you know, a false negative matters because maybe you, you have to self-quarantine for two weeks and it turns out you were fine. Uh, false positives matter. Uh, and, uh, you know, there hasn't been the same investment. Like there's global investment in vaccines because it's a global pandemic. Uh, there, there was global investment in genetic research. And that's why DNA technology has lots of uses in criminal cases, which can be uh, sometimes quite probative, quite reliable. And no one ever invested in tool marks work. No one ever invested in fingerprints. And what's been so shocking is that, you know, there are just a handful of studies that have even purported to, to look at how accurate these disciplines are, even though they're used in vast numbers of cases every year. Um, I start the book by talking about a fingerprint match gone wrong, uh, well known in the fingerprint world, but maybe not so much to the public because you know when you when I talk to people and survey people, people assume that fingerprinting is actually even more reliable than DNA because DNA reduces information to numbers, but fingerprints they're just unique patterns. It's like even better than numbers, right? Our fingerprints are unique. It's all like a metaphor for individuality. Our finger all over this, or our fingerprints are all over that. It's, uh, but but fingerprints although. They're, you know, you look at your fingertips, there's tons of information there. People don't fully appreciate, unless you've tried to unlock an iPhone that works on fingerprints, and then you see how frustrating it is. Uh, people don't appreciate how little information can be left in a latent print, left at a crime scene, because, you know, criminals are not trying to purposely leave a really good print. And in the well-known Brandon Mayfield case, there was a latent print left at the scene of a terror bombing in Madrid on a plastic bag that had some unexploded detonators in it, in a white van, Police are all—they're always right to search the suspicious white van, and they find a latent print on this bag. But it was a crinkly bag, and you can see that the, from dusting the powder on it, that there's lots of marks from the dust, and there's tons of missing information there. Nevertheless, you can tell it's kind of an arch shape, and the FBI, trying to assist in this terror investigation, runs it through a huge international database, and that alone you know, is an interesting and important aspect of the case because. There is no way without a gigantic database that an innocent person halfway across the world would have ever been a suspect. He'd never been to Spain. And, and people assume that technology is making forensics more reliable. And it is, and it isn't. But you never would have an innocent person uh, pulled un unless you had a huge database with hundreds of millions of candidate prints. And the job of that algorithm is to pick the ones that look most like the, the latent print from this scene. And lo and behold, it pulls candidates. And his actually wasn't the first one that the algorithm chose, but the FBI examiner sees his fourth and says, I think that's the one and marks it up side by side, which can create a sort of matchy matchy looking for similarities, circular reasoning effect. More circular reasoning and reinforcement occurred because two other FBI analysts looked at it. One I think was retired, or maybe two were retired. They're all extremely experienced. They all agreed with each other. They all reinforced each other's conclusions. They all said 100% identification at a time when it wasn't just like CSI and people believed it, it's what FBI and other fingerprint examiners said and were required to say in court, that they were infallible, that they had a zero error rate, that they did not make mistakes, that the only people who could ever make a mistake doing fingerprint work were incompetent people or malevolent people, people who are not following the method correctly. These were three senior experienced people. They were following the method correctly. Having three people involved was also like a marker of a really high profile case. On TV, they may have teams of forensic analysts, but in real life, you can't spare three people to look at one print. 
but they, they, you know, no cost spared in, a, in the Madrid terror case, given its seriousness. And all three of them are wrong. And, you know, Brandon Mayfield stood up in court and said, that's not my prince. Like, he's never been to Spain. Uh, his lawyer wasn't, uh, you know, a fool. And they hired their own defense fingerprint expert who looks over the markings, 15 points in common that the FBI had made and says, yeah, it's his print. Even the defense expert was swayed by the authoritative weight of these three experienced FBI dudes. And, uh, and so four people got it completely wrong. The Spanish authorities, you know, link the print to someone who is an actual, you know, known Algerian terrorist suspect who was in the area and had, you know, they were monitoring a cell of terrorists. Like, they're like, okay, we found the one. And even then the FBI was like, oh, no, 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 15 points. We can't be wrong. They flew to Madrid. They put up the pictures and, and made the, put on this whole dog and pony show for the Spanish authorities who are kind of like, what are you talking about? Some lawyer in Portland? It doesn't make any sense. They eventually, you know, dropped the charges, apologized to Mayfield. But no longer can one say that, oh, only incompetent, mistaken, or malicious fingerprint examiners make mistakes. And it raised the question, how often does this happen? We're starting to learn more about how often this happens now that studies looking at error rates have started to be done. And for some disciplines, there are really quite terrifying error rates. And for raising the question whether the work should ever be allowed in court. For others, it's just highly variable. And very experienced people really may have something to their experience. They really may make mistakes less. But when they are heavily biased, like in the circumstances in the Mayfield case, they may make terrible mistakes. When you have a lot of missing information, like with the poor print in the Mayfield case, you may make a lot of mistakes. And we don't know any of this. And our jurors are left in the dark. And labs typically do not provide any meaningful documentation of their work. There's no way as a lawyer you can look at what they did and oh, this is what they marked. This is how long they spent on it. This, is, this was their process. Instead, and this is, this is certainly true um, in Philadelphia, the, the home of our, our event today, you know, the lab reports that, that, that uh, defense lawyers and prosecutors get in Philadelphia are basically a page and a half long with really only one line which says, you know, this fingerprint, this firearm was identified as coming from the source. And the rest of the one and a half pages is just sort of the sign-offs and the names, the, you know, the numbers associated with each piece of evidence, nothing, nothing particularly useful. No real documentation of the work the product or the process. And so you have evidence that may or not may not be well collected. You have poor documentation of what these people do. They come into court claiming expertise, but they've never been tested in any meaningful way. So you don't know how good they are at the thing that they say that they are doing. That process they follow may be an ill-defined method which requires some judgment, that's fine. People can be good at what they do based on experience and training and judgment, but no one knows how good this particular person is at following their judgment. And the labs themselves may not have any real testing or auditing or quality control like you would have at any hospital that does a strep test or a COVID test where there are all sorts of quality controls in place to make sure that terrible tragic mistakes don't occur. And finally, you know, judges don't insist that any of this happen, even in, you know, states like, like where I live now in North Carolina, where there's a reliability rule, the Daubert rule is in full force. Judges are supposed to be looking at whether an expert is doing something reliable and is following a reliable method and is applying it reliably. They don't ask any of these questions about where's the documentation, where's the data. Uh, and so they've, they've just given uh, prosecution side evidence a pass. There's an article I wrote in the University of Pennsylvania Law Review with Greg Mitchell saying that expertise should be defined by proficiency. We shouldn't let someone be a self-professed expert. We shouldn't let someone come to court and say, I'm an expert because what I do is expert. There should be objective evidence that the person is actually good at what they claim to be doing. And uh, you know, we, we insist on that in all sorts of disciplines that really matter to us, but for somehow in criminal cases where life and liberty are at stake, there's rarely a battle of the experts. The defense rarely has any resources from the court to hire their own expert. And you have a self-professed expert. One last example of why it matters to actually know how good experts are and to test them. Um, outside of criminal cases, there are other people who have difficult jobs where they have to stare at screens all day and reach really important conclusions. One type of job, which is a little foreign to us right now because it's been so long since most of us have been near an airport, are TSA screeners. They look at screens looking for patterns, just like fingerprint examiners and firearms and tool marks examiners. And it's tedious, and people get angry if they take too long because their luggage gets held up and they miss their flights, and so they don't have that much time to, to look at, e at the screen, uh, and it's really, really important. Uh, well, they do blind testing, and when, when the TSA ran bombs as a test, 
through, through the conveyors maybe six or seven years ago, 95% of the bombs went undetected. And they realized they had a serious problem. They totally redid their training. There was a leadership turnover at TSA. It was a scandal like some of the lab scandals we're seeing across the country uh, right now. Uh, but they didn't figure, okay, we caught a problem, we're done. They did repeat blind testing. And the next time they had more like 70% of the bombs detected, which was better, but still really concerning. And so they didn't rest on their laurels. They've continued to try to make improvements and improve their training and to do this type of blind testing. TSA does it. Our crime labs, for the most part, do not, with rare exceptions, one of the important rare exceptions, which I highlight in the book as, as sort of the, as the global model, the, the Houston Forensic Science Center, which actually does blind testing so that you know something about how good the work is and you catch errors when it's a test, when no one's life is at stake, when you can fix the problem without any harm to individuals. So I've talked too long. Uh, I really want to hear from ETL and Anika and hear your questions, but thank you all. It's a, it's a treat to get to share uh, Autopsy of a Crime Lab with you all today. Thanks, Brandon. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, there's so much in the book. And so I know it's hard to compress it into a very short summary. I mean, one of the things that I really appreciated about the book is this, you know, it has a nice blend of discussing kind of the development and the history of some of these techniques, some of the scholarship that has developed that helps us understand sources of error. And then also, you know, stories like the Brandon Mayfield case, individual cases, real people, uh, and how uh, you know these errors affect them, and so you know I want to take some time with our other panelists to just explore a few of those dimensions. So uh, you know, Menka, you you of course have ha had an opportunity at uh, PDS to be able to see firsthand how some of the problems that Brandon writes about manifest or in in real cases. I'm wondering if maybe you could describe for or audience a particularly memorable case where you see some forensic errors and, and you know, maybe some of the lessons that we take about system design from that case. Um, absolutely, Paul. Before I get into the meat of the answer, I just wanna thank um, Brandon and you and uh, everyone at the Quattrone Center for, for having me and having this important discussion about these issues. Um, and for everyone who's here joining us um, this afternoon, it's really nice to see um, just so many folks in this participant list, some who I know and so many, many who I don't because these are really important issues and it's, it's really wonderful to be able to exchange ideas with everyone. Um, so thank you. So, so absolutely, and I agree with you about the book, you know, it does a really nice job of, of laying out, you know, both sort of the evolution and the research, but also the real practical impacts of um, faulty forensics in cases. And the point I want to emphasize is that it's real. We saw, I mean, as a public defender, I saw it regularly and everyone who is still practicing as a defense lawyer sees it regularly. And so um, I have a few examples, but I actually want to focus on one that's a bit more optimistic and ties in some of the recommendation that Brandon makes in the book and, and sort of shows us how when implemented, you can actually have just results. Um, and so the case I'm thinking of is a burglary case, if I'm remembering correctly, that turned on fingerprint evidence. That was the key, if not the only evidence in the case. And the case um, was happening, uh, I wanna say 2017 or 2018. So just a couple of years after that, um, you know, landmark 2016 PCAS report was issued that was highlighting flaws in a bunch of these different disciplines. And the lawyer, I was involved in the case um, assisting the supervision of that issue um, and the lawyer who was trying the case. And what she was able to do was she was able to um, expose a lot of the issues that Brandon describes um, both as issues within the fingerprint discipline, but also as things that the jurors need to know to really understand the flaws with the discipline. So she cross-examined the examiner on what the PCAS report found, and in particular, error rates. And so sort of dispelling the jurors' notion that fingerprint evidence is incredibly reliable, and sometimes the jurors feel, as, as Brandon said, and it is in the book, um, it's even more reliable than DNA. So really sort of deliberately charting that out, charting out the subjectivity of the discipline, um, charting out um, all of the concerns raised in the report, charting out the lack of 
real scientific training of the examiner, charting out the bias that can infect the decision making. Um, and ultimately what happened was, and was that the client was acquitted. Um, and it was primarily based on that very thorough, deliberate cross-examination that exposed those flaws and gave the jury um, a real sense of what the fallibility was and sort of dispelled the notion of infallibility. Um, and I really wanna emphasize that had this happen in a different jurisdiction where all of the work that goes into that um, might not have happened or had it happened um, in a situation where that cross-examination wasn't allowed, wasn't permitted, and that litigation hadn't been done beforehand, that client would absolutely have been convicted. Um, and so that's an example about the real world application of how not only um, these flaws really exist and they're happening on a daily basis around the country, but also on how some of the things that, that the book talks about um, really can improve the way people perceive that evidence and lead to more just outcomes. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a good example, although there are many more. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's a really interesting example. And I think it kind of highlights the importance of, you know, kind of research and education. I know uh, ETL, you know, you've been very involved in, you know, serving as an expert and trying to educate lawyers and judges on this, these topics and also, you know, doing some of the foundational research, right? I mean, Brandon has this nice analogy in the book, you know, as the judgment of Paris was for the wine world, right? Where it kind of creates this sea change in how we understand kind of wine experts and the quality of wines. So too is some of the work that you've done, you know, you know, it's kind of a similar type thing, but with respect to uh, forensic science, forensic examiners. I, I'm wondering if maybe you could just pick, you know, you, you've published a lot in this area, but you know, if you could pick maybe just a favorite study that you've done, you know, if you want to talk about fingerprints, if you want to talk about another discipline, you know, just describe the study for our audience and help us understand a little bit better how this research can feed into the sort of insights that, you know, Menka is describing that ultimately can go up and, you know, help better ed educate, hopefully, uh, jurors and, and uh, judges. Um, I can tell you very briefly, and I will about the new study, but I want to set the background to the problems, because the problems are big and they're depressing, because let's start with the error rate studies that uh, were mentioned. They used to say zero error rate were infallible, and now they have all these new error rate studies giving, in many domains, very small numbers, but all these error rate uh, studies are faulty and bringing misleading and inaccurate error rates. So they move from zero to you know, 0 0.1 or whatever. For example, they don't include evidence that appears in real case work. So if you look at fingerprint and other error rate studies, every examiner will tell you that they get latent prints and that are low quality. And the result of the comparison is inconclusive. So you have a pair of fingerprint marks where the result is inconclusive. They don't include inconclusive evidence in the error rate studies. And in the error rate studies, if they say the decision is inconclusive, they don't count it as error rate. They don't count it as a potential error. Some of them even count it as correct response. And when do they say inconclusive? When it's a difficult match or exclusion, they say inconclusive and they can't be wrong. And if you compare the rate of inconclusive in this error rate study is much, much higher than you get in real cases. In some error rate studies, you get 20, 30, 50, 80% of the time they say inconclusive. The, and I can go on and on, I have a, a paper on that. So that even the error rate studies that are used now, and it's good that we're having them rather than saying we have zero with no data are inaccurate and misleading uh, the court. Now you have to remember that we're lucky if we even discuss error rate in court because most of the cases are plea bargained, right? If the plea bargained, what 90, 95% is plea bargained, then the forensic experts are not questioned in court. The forensic experts, most of them work for the police or even for the DA office. You know, there are exceptions like the Houston Forensic Science Center, but most of them work in the DA. They get a plea bargained. They don't want to study error rates properly, and I don't blame them 
because it's an adversarial legal system, right? They don't want it used against them. It will damage the reputation. They don't see their own bias because of the bias blind spot. And I can go on and on and on and I'll stop here and just talk about the latest study. But this is the background of denial of the bias and fighting it. Now you said, you know, in fingerprint and DNA, yes, the, there is good news because I hear, you know, Brendan, we need an autopsy of the crime lab and things have moved forward in the fingerprint in uh, many uh, forensic uh, domain. But you have to remember that in the forensic domain, we don't know the ground truth. I'm now doing an autopsy of a plane crash. I'm a part of an expert team. I'm looking at the pilot error and bias. I'm investigating a number of police shooting, whether the police was biased in their decision. But in the plane crash, we have a plane that crashed. In the police case, we have a dead body. They shot someone. When a forensic examiner makes a mistake, we don't know she made a mistake because we don't know the ground truth and it's plea bargain. So we don't have that problem like we have in aviation, in police shooting, in the medical domain when we have errors. Now the forensic science domain, I don't want to sound too depressing, has moved forward. And you know, the book, like the autopsy of the crime lab really exposed this. But one domain, and this is where I'm going to very briefly talk about uh, this new study that has managed to avoid all of this in forensic pathology. The forensic pathology said, we are different. We are medical doctors. We need to know everything. And they have resisted taking any measurements to acknowledge bias or accept bias. And I say to them, okay, you're not like a fingerprint, a DNA exam, you're medical doctors, but medical doctors, I work in the medical domain more than I work in the forensic domain in the United States in the biggest and best hospital, Mass General Hospital and other hospitals in the US and around the world. Doctors acknowledge their bias. It's well documented in dozens and dozens of articles how biases impact medical decision-making, even medical devices. So they have fought it and blocked me and others from collecting data. And now at last, the first paper came out just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's uh, open access, so everyone can access it if they want in the Journal of Forensic Science. And it has two very different data set, and I'll just say it really, really briefly. One is death certificates. We were able to get every death certificate in the state of Nevada for over 10 years. We had 200,000 death certificates. We filled out the children's death certificate and compared black and white kids and found that black kids relative to white kids, the death certificate is going to determine homicide much more and white kids accident. And as we say in the paper, it could be that actually black children are murdered more than white children. But that gives you a base rate expectation because this could have been in the past or may change in the future, but they're used to case after case after case, the black babies, homicide, the white babies associated with accidents. So this is decisions in real cases. But then we supplemented it. We did a research with 133 experts, uh, who, people who signed their certificate, gave them exactly the same case, a child looks like an accident and all the medical information was identical between the two groups. Half of them, we said the child is black and was brought to the hospital by the mother's boyfriend. And to the other half, we said the child was white and brought by the grandmother. And you won't believe this huge effect. White kid, grandmother, they accept it's an accident. Black kid brought by the mother's boyfriend, no, it's homicide. And you can read the paper. So this is a new study, the first ever study to examine bias and error in forensic pathology. But the big news is not the data. The big news is the response of the forensic pathology community and the professional organization, National Association of Medical Examiners, they have gone berserk, a campaign of complaints and letters. We got nine letters to the editor. One of them signed by over 50 forensic pathologists. They've requested that the paper be retracted. They filed complaints against me to the university, saying I'm a disgrace and embarrassment to science and the university. And this is the problem. And this is why the autopsy of the crime lab book is so critical because to solve the problem, we need to acknowledge a bias. We need to put the things on the table. 
and this is the biggest problem in forensic science and in the criminal justice system. The system has to acknowledge mistakes and improve. And if it doesn't do it, things don't get any better. And this I think is what is really important. And this last research is one more kind of nail in the coffin of seeing not willing to take it on. And I do have to say that I am sympathetic in the adversarial system. If you collaborate, if you show and acknowledge that error exists or bias, they're going to cross examine you and use it against you. Why are you going to give ammunition to the other side? So there's a fundamental systemic problem being an adversarial system is not scientific, it's anti-scientific. I have much more to say, but uh, I'll shut up to give time for a discussion. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like to, you know, just draw out this theme a little bit more. And I appreciate ETLU pointing to, you know, hey, maybe part of the solution here is just admitting there's a problem. But, you know, I, I, I think in the book, in your comments, Amenka, you've actually written about, you know, how uh, DOJ, you know, continues to defend publicly things like pattern evidence that don't have scientific basis. So I'd be interested in the panel's thoughts. I mean, you know, other than acknowledging the problem, you know, how, how do we how do we address the resistance or the reluctance of experts and in some cases prosecutors to you know to to recognize the possibility of error? I mean, is it judges' responsibility? You know, should we be doing more research? You know, you know. Who ought to be acting here? Um, I'm happy to start answering that question. Um, and I, I, I think the answer is all of those things, right? I mean, I think the judges have fallen over and the judges need to step up. And, and Brandon talks about that in, in the book about revisiting their role as gate, gatekeepers. Um, I think the research that was never done needs to be done. and. Um, disciplines that have been deemed as unreliable or unvalidated, need, we need to stop using them until if and when there is research that supports their validity. Um, you know, in terms of the prosecutors, um, this ties into one of the questions that's that was actually that's in the Q&A right now. Um, you know, what has their reaction to be? And we need we absolutely need to confront that problem um, because on their end, you know, obviously not as I'm not a prosecutor, um, but you know, I, I would I would suspect that there's there's multiple reasons for the reticence to 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 sort of acknowledge the fallibility of some of these disciplines, and one is the obvious one that you know Etiel just mentioned, which is you know it's going to um, jeopardize their ability to secure convictions, right? So as Brandon's laid out in the book. I mean, forensics has been a superb tool for um, prosecutors and law enforcement for decades, if not much longer. Um, and acknowledging the problems with the disciplines is, is going to inhibit their ability to, to prosecute cases. And, and, and that's you know, one of the main things that needs to be confronted. Um, you know, but I, I do think that it's more than just that. I think that there's there's nuance to the problem with, with um, prosecutors' sort of reluctance to acknowledge some of this. Um, and, you know, one of it is, it, you know, Etiel can sp speak to this better than I can, but, you know, one of it appears to be a, a cognitive dissonance. Like, it's hard to embrace the fact that you're using faulty evidence. It's hard to embrace that perhaps you're using unreliable evidence and data to put people in prison for a long time. That's a difficult thing for one to grapple with. And I, I really want to just piggyback on the point he made earlier um, that it, it really is a nuanced problem because it's, um, you know, like it, it, it's a systems problem. It's a systemic problem. Um, we, have, we have allowed the evolution, not just of a forensic system, but a criminal legal system overall that's hugely punitive and oppressive. And as he describes, you know, adversarial. And until we reckon with that, until, until there's, there's a sort of recognition um, that we are desensitized to the ways in which it is punitive and the way in which forensics increases the punitive nature of it. Um, we're not going to we're not going to um, we're not going to see real solutions. And that's why my initial answer to the question is all of those things. You know, the research, the 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 quality control, the proficiency testing, the the judges as actors. Um, you know, all of those, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's one singular solution. I mean, it's, it's all of these things, the, the regulation that Brandon describes, 
Um, and to just sort of fold in the question that was in the Q and A, you know, how have we're we're talking about um, you know sort of prosecutors and their role in this? And the question was, how have they responded? Um, and you know, if if the person who wrote the question hasn't um, read the book yet, I encourage you to do because it, to do it because it sort of lays out their responses to the key moments in in sort of the evolution and history of forensics really well. And there's been a pattern of pushback, a pattern of unwillingness to, um, you know, sort of acknowledge the research as it's being conducted, um, sort of over and over again. And, and key moments being even before the 2009 NES report came out, and then when it came out, even before the 2016 PCAST report came out, and then after it came out, unwillingness to acknowledge the findings, unwillingness to dig deeper, unwillingness to provide research, um, just, just a just I don't know, blanket pushback almost. Um, so I, I think that's a starting point to my answer, but I, I do wanna let other folks jump in and, um, and add the layers. There are two problems. One is the criminal justice system and one is forensic science. So I'm not going to solve the criminal justice system. I just say that the judges in the department of justice are mainly ex-prosecutors. So there's a huge bias in the entire system because it's rare to have people who are public defenders work at the DOJ or as judges. So if the system of the DOJ and the judges is very prosecution, A, and B, we do what I mentioned, mass plea bargaining. How can we talk about justice in the system? But let me focus very quickly on the forensic science domain. I think two things. First of all, context management. We need to make sure that not only forensic domains that are not valid don't get to court, but if a forensic examiner is exposed to task irrelevant biasing information, then they cannot testify and they cannot do a case. That will end the problem. If they cannot talk to the detectives and get background stories, they don't know that, you know, I have research with Brendan and others showing that, you know, 42% of the formal submission forms in fingerprint in the United States, tell the fingerprint examiner if the suspect had a criminal record. The minute a forensic examiner is exposed, if a suspect confessed, if they have a criminal record, that's it. They cannot testify and they cannot do the evidence. That's number one, to bias, to make sure they're minimally biased by not allowing the testimony of people who are exposed to biasing task irrelevant information. And two, independence. We need to give the forensic examiner independence of mind. They need to work separate from the DA and the police. Rather than a tightly knit group of forensic evidence, police, DA, the science needs to be as independent as possible from law enforcement and the DA, right? We have in the United States, I believe, a number of crime labs that are not part of the police. They're part of the DA. So this is totally not good to do proper science and will improve science and we want science to be used in the criminal justice system and not as it is now where it's misused and abused. I don't want us to leave uh, defense lawyers off the hook either because you know when you read transcripts of uh, forensic expert testimony including in cases where mistakes were absolutely made and innocent persons went to prison you know, those transcripts are often not very long because the defense lawyer asks no questions and there are glaring mistakes just on the face of the trial record and the defense lawyer says nothing. Their cross-examination is like a page long. And, you know, um, it's it just it's a embarrassment in terms of... Uh, but Brandon, let me ask you a question in the middle. It goes back to balance. I don't appear a lot in court, but in the U.S. I've appeared for public defenders and federal prosecution. The public defender to argue on every cent of my hourly rate and wait six months to get paid. The prosecution, I just say a number, a week later I get it, they say, do you want more? So there's not equal resources for the defense and the prosecution, and that's hard for the defense to bring up a proper defense. It is, and I, I have a new paper with Greg Mitchell talking about how you know more effective than there's this myth that cross-examination, that's the way to test things out in the courtroom. The defense needs access to their own expert. Uh, and and we know that it, it's uh, not trivial in some disciplines, the degree to which another set of eyes, the person may form a conclusion entirely about the evidence. But even apart from someone looking at the evidence and saying, oh, wait a minute, um, I don't think these, these uh, bullets or casings came from the same weapon. 
we've had a lot of wait a minutes like that in the DC lab recently. We had lots of different people come to completely different conclusions around the same evidence. So this is a pressing problem. Uh, but even if the defense expert doesn't think anything different in terms of the evidence, to have someone else explain the method and the limitations, enormously impactful to jurors. It's not just cross, it's a separate expert saying, look, uh, these are the boundaries of the discipline. Um, and that's, you know, a methods only expert. And that person doesn't have to be, you know, a retired latent fingerprint examiner. That person could be a statistician or a cognitive neuroscientist like ETL explaining, you know, there've been important trials where, for example, my friend Karen Caffeter, another one of the parts of the leadership of CSAFE has testified as a statistician saying like, I've never looked at hairs under a microscope. That's not really what we do as statisticians. Uh, but I can tell you something about how one can arrive at frequencies and talk about probabilities. To do that, you have to have information about probabilities and you can't make it up. It's no more basic than that. It's sort of statistics 101, but she did a wonderful job in a case in Massachusetts explaining statistics 101 and the judge was like, oh, wait, really? So like, we actually don't know like how common or rare it is to have any particular characteristics in hairs. Like, like no, we don't. There have never been any, uh, any statistics underlying this field. And therefore like as, uh, as a leading statistician, I will tell you that you can't say stuff about probabilities if you have no statistics. And that's, you know, that was really, really powerful testimony and it didn't take someone from within the discipline to do it. Uh, but, you know, indigent defendants don't have good rights to get experts and judges routinely deny funding for expert testimony. Um, defense lawyers are overworked. And so maybe it's no surprise. It's not just laziness that they don't meet with the expert. They don't ask for the discovery, even if it is available. Then again, when they ask, judges often say, no, you can't get the records of this person's proficiency test. That's not relevant. You can't get discovery regarding quality issues in the lab. How could that possibly be relevant? What's going on in the lab in general and not in this person's case? Well, then when we have major scandals erupt, like in Massachusetts, they just, you know, they're reopening another 70,000 cases. All of a sudden it's like, oh, wait a minute, maybe quality issues in the lab were relevant. Maybe, maybe we should have let defense lawyers inquire into larger quality issues. Uh, but when they've asked, they've been shut down by judges and they never you know, have the resources to launch those type of uh, inquiries. And there's a larger problem, uh, which is that in our courts, like we don't do systemic really in criminal cases. It's very hard to bring a class action, but when, when, all, when labs have quality issues, when they don't do block out task irrelevant information like ETL was talking about, when they don't do blind proficiency testing, when they don't insist on good documentation, when they have a method that's poorly defined, and so it's not clear what any particular examiner is doing. Now, you can have an accredited lab that has all those problems because accreditation is just sort of bare minimum paperwork and procedure. Uh, when we don't do good quality control labs, it looks like a mass tort. And you know there may be tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cases affected. And yet labs, it's not like they even necessarily have a list. Like when the FBI did its audit of old hair cases, it's not like they're like, oh, let's pull the list of all the cases that our FBI analysts testified in and we'll look at all those cases. Uh, that, that there was not even a list. Uh, there isn't just basic information kept going back, particularly who worked on what cases, was the person convicted, what was the work done so that we can audit it. Uh, and so even just that basic retrospective, and of course, so many labs have gone through changes, including due to scandals, is that there, just, there may not be records of the prior incarnation of the lab or the prior incarnation before that, um, to, you know, to have lists of cases so that you can reopen them if there's a problem, to have routine testing so that you know when there's a problem, so that you can have remedies in the courts so that judges can look at the 10,000 cases or the 1,000 cases if there's a problem and look at them as a group and figure out, okay, we need to resentence everyone because we can no longer convict them based on the presence of drugs. The, the drug testing program in this lab was contaminated. Uh, there, there's just no procedure for any of that. And so even when errors come to light, there's often very little in the way of justice for people who are affected by forensic errors because we just don't have a system that acts like a system. Yeah, certainly having done some recent uh, work at the Quattrone Center thinking about roadside drug tests, just finding which cases have that type of evidence, very difficult. So I wanted to turn attention to one of the audience questions, which I think kind of connects with our discussion. So, you know, the, the audience member points out that, you know, despite the challenges that we've highlighted, there are some areas where you know, DOJ has acknowledged in the book, you know, you talk some about hair microscopy, there's obviously, uh, you know, fire and arson, you know, where there's been some progress. C can we make, like, why is it that in some areas, it seems like we're able to go further in terms of, 
advancing understanding and rejecting flawed forensic? And are, are there lessons that we might take from those experiences that we could apply to some of these other disciplines? A lot of positive things have happened. We've focused a lot on the negative, um, but I don't know. I think it's a pretty exciting thing that detail that you're talking to labs around the world, that it's no longer a taboo topic to talk about cognitive bias um, and that there's this openness, there's this receptivity, uh, cases like maybe high profile cases like the Brandon Mayfield may have you know, cemented the idea that, oh, wait a minute, cognitive bias matters and we need to think about precautions. Uh, and you know, the UK, the Forensic Science Regulator's Guidance on Cognitive Bias, no document like that existed a few years ago. Um, we do have more labs at least experimenting and trying out blinding or blind verification, if not blind proficiency testing, like the program at the, uh, at the HFSC. Um, we have much more cautious language being rolled out in some of these disciplines, and the DOJ has issued these uniform standards. I think there are real problems with those, that uniform language, and it doesn't go very far, but it's a, it's a start to at least be thinking about what experts should be permitted to say in court, given the boundaries of their discipline. You know, when I first started looking at, you know, the trial testimony of forensic experts who testified in DNA exoneree cases, I had labs calling me saying, oh, can you send me the transcript? Because we don't, we don't, you know, we don't ever look at those things. Like it's, it wasn't a routine part of supervision to read uh, what your experts are saying in court. Uh, and so there have been some really important culture change you know, there are now some black box studies being done to look at accuracy issues and disciplines. And there's an openness to even, you know, report on some of that as part of your reporting for your work. Like, okay, like I'm an examiner, but, you know, the examiners in my discipline are not infallible. We're not superhuman. Uh, this is the uncertainty associated with the measurement. I mean, it's sort of laughable that in the past, there was no uncertainty associated with measurement. I mean, there's, there's uncertainty associated with using a tape measure. Uh, I'm certainly terrible with measuring furniture. Like I never get it right. Uh, like a ruler, there's uncertainty. Any kind of measurement, there's uncertainty and you report it, you take it into account. You know that you better order a couch that's plus or minus a few inches because uh, you're just not so great at eyeballing where you left the tape measure on the on the curved couch or whatever. Um, and so I, I really do think that there's, there's much better efforts at scientific literacy at law schools and in the bar for continuing legal education. There are a lot of great people that have been working hard on these issues, and I, I don't want this to be a downer of an event because uh, there's a lot of really interesting, important work being done. You know, um, uh, folks at PDS in DC have won important victories in the courtroom. We now have lengthy opinions from judges that are citing to ETL's work, that are citing to black box studies. You have judges actually like talking about methods and inconclusives and false positives and negatives and in their opinions, it's, it's, it really does look different than it did a decade ago. Other thoughts from the other panelists on that uh, issue? Lessons from the areas where we've made some progress? I definitely agree there's been a huge progress uh, in many domains uh, in openness. So I agree with that. I would say that sometimes uh, it's a, an old book with the new cover or putting lipstick on a pig so they don't say I individualize the fingerprint, it's a match and the fingerprint examiner looks at the jaw's eyes and say, I've been doing it for 20 years and I'm very confident, that's very persuasive. So there are cases they believe where things have changed, uh, uh, limited, even the black box studies, they move from zero error rate to 0 0.01 error or stuff like that, ignoring the fact that if their studies, if they take two fingerprints and match them and an examiner makes a decision, if you give the same prints to the same examiner a few weeks later, 10% of the time they'll reach a different conclusion. So there's some data that is buried in the studies. However, I do agree, ex excluding the forensic pathologists that are in denial and fighting, that there's been a huge change in the, the a paper by Brown found and other looking 20 years ago, no papers, no discussion, no conference presentation on error or on bias. And starting around, you know, 2005, and then with the NAS, the number of studies talking about error rate management and bias is huge. Change is happening. Yes, it's slowly, it's painful, but this is the nature of change. And let me tell you, as someone who works in the military and medical domain, 
they also have a big, big problem to change and it takes a long time to change the culture. And forensic science, if I had to rank it relative to the medical domain and the military, they're changing the speed of lightning, they're changing the forensic science, there's still a way to go. I've been great compared to the military and the medical changes that take more time. So we're in a good trajectory, but I think we need to continue to push and judges and everyone uh, needs to try to contribute to move forward. But I'm not optimistic in my nature. I'm not pessimistic, I'm realistic. So I think the cup is really half full and half empty right now. Well, maybe to finish us off, because we've mentioned a variety of, uh, you know, kind of issues and problems, and I want to just do kind of a, a prioritization question for each of the panelists. So, you know, let's imagine that someone were to hand you $5 million today and say, spend it however you want to improve validity, validity of science in the courtroom. But, you know, what would you want to do? Is it more foundational studies like what EDL is doing? Is it better research to practice? Do we need more standard settings organizations? How, you know, how, how, how would you think about you know, deploying resources to improve the process? Where would your priorities be? I'm happy to start. Um, so I, I think a couple of things. The first is to really take note of ETL's first point, which is that when we look at progress, yeah, of course, there's absolutely been progress. I mean, I think Mayfield was a watershed moment and it led to a lot of positive change. Um, but when we peel back the layers as we look at progress, we have to make sure it's substantive progress, not the, you know, as he described the lipstick on a pig, it has to be substantive. It has to not be Band-Aid fixes. And so, um, as I, I started out by saying, I think we need to do all the things, but if you gave me all the money to do all the things, I would say what I said before, which is immediately stop use, you, disallow use of unvalidated forensic disciplines in criminal cases until foundational validity is established. That, that's a bare minimum, I think. We have the, the numbers of wrongful convictions are, are you know, we, we, there's more and more every year. And so for me, that's a fundamental change that needs to be made because all the other things we're talking about, things like standards bodies, things like quality control, those are back end fixes, right? We need the front end fix first. Um, and so that's where I would start. Um, those are good things. They're not bad things. We do, we do want standards. We want qual quality control. We want all of those things as well. Um, but before we have um, fundamental validity established in, in everything that we're trying to use to, see, to earn a conviction, I, we stop until we get there. And that's, that's, that's what I would um, start by saying. I would spend the $5 million on pilot programs to do blind validity labs to give them the resources to help do that. But, uh, I, I don't know if I see that as retrospective, like catching errors as, as they happen in real time, really important. And in some ways it addresses questions of uh, validity better than black box studies, better to catch errors in the real case flow of people um, that you know may reflect issues at multiple stages of what a lab is doing. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 you know if, if, if I was gonna, if there was gonna be like a federal grant program to crime labs, uh, better than the backlog elimination acts, which also give labs an incentive to keep up the backlog so they can keep getting the grants. Rather have a a quality and testing grant program, uh, um, and uh, you know I, I think it could be the Brandon Mayfield Laboratory Improvement Pro Grant Program that we could add to the Coverdale and the Bloodsworth grants. We should have the the Brandon Mayfield uh, Federal Quality Improvement Program. Did you say 5 million or 50 million? I didn't hear, but regardless of the amount of money, I don't, yeah, yeah. Think, I don't think more money is needed. There is money out there. It's a matter of priority. And the priority to deal with that is what is important. And for that, we need public and political pressure and the judges pressuring the forensic scientist to improve and to do a proper job. So it's a matter of pressure to cause forensic examiners and forensic lab to do a proper job. And many times forensic examiners, when I show them a problem, they say the court accepts it and they don't care anymore. If the court accepts it, they're happy. 
What we need is pressure by the courts, politicians, and the public to improve the criminal justice system. We all know the criminal justice system is not working well or as well as it should. And forensic science is supposed to be the highlight, the, the, you know, the bit of sunshine in the gray sky of the criminal justice system to help put the criminal justice system on a better course. And science can do that and forensic science can do that. We need it just to push this forward. Also, if you talk about money, right, Massachusetts has spent over $30 million so far unwinding like two horrific lab scandals that no one caught for years because there was no even minimal quality control at their drug labs. And, uh, um, you know, drug testing involves chemical assays. There's certainly some interpretation because you don't have, you know, pure cocaine that's seized every time. But um, this is like work that's in large part involving equipment and chemical assays. And nevertheless, quality control was so poor at those labs that you had people who were using the drugs and not even testing it, and no one knew any different. They thought they were really efficient uh, lab chemists. The, the reports would come out so quickly. Um, and, uh, um, and it's been enormously expensive to, to unwind the tens and tens of thousands of cases that were tainted by lab misconduct. And, you know, people sometimes say it's a bad apple, but it was a Bad apples, you know what they do to barrels, and that's what happened in, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, we're seeing some of the same uh, concerns in D.C. right now, where if you have a lab where people can be altering conclusions in firearms cases, saying, oh, well, maybe it's actually inconclusive. We can't be wrong if it's inconclusive. Uh, you know, it, it, it may take some time and some real expense to unwind the number of cases that may have been affected uh, by a culture uh, where clearly... Uh, forensic conclusions are malleable and subject to influence, and that's not that's not science. And there may have been terrible injustices as a result. That's going to be expensive. Uh, it's expensive when these problems metastasize, and uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is can prevent millions and millions of dollars in cure, and many many people who spend many years of their lives in prison for crimes they don't commit. And, and Brendan, Brent you agree, you, Brendan, you agree that what we need is an autopsy of a crime lab. <laughs> um, I just want to add one thing because it's, it's right to Brandon, Brandon's point that he just made. Um, the DC lab is a sort of theoretically independent lab. It is an independent lab. Um, and I, one thing that um, he touched upon that we haven't said explicitly, but that the thread that's woven through all of this is is culture change. Um, and you know that's a culture change from in, in on two fronts. One from what Etiel was talking about from the crime lab being separated from law enforcement but also from forensic scientists um, sort of getting into mainstream, being, being part of the mainstream research science culture um, that you know, sort of embraces mistake as part of science. Because it, it, regardless of how independent a lab is, if the forensic scientists in the lab aren't bred with that culture from the ground up, we'll, we'll keep seeing the problems that Brandon's describing that are pervading the DC lab right now, which is an independent lab. Um, so I just wanted to flag that. I actually think that idea of you know changing the culture is a great uh, way to uh, finish up. Uh, and for those uh, who didn't catch it, I'll just repeat. And you know this is a good uh, word for us as we conclude our CLE. Uh, second code word is action, right? And I think what you've convinced me of with this conversation is that this really is a rich area, and there's lots of opportunities for those who are here with us. Uh, to learn more, we encourage you. We've got a link. Uh, get the book, read it. Uh, you'll learn from it. Uh, we have some links to some of the research uh, that EDL has described, which I think just you know really provides some uh, uh, important and, and you know to be honest, in some cases, kind of shocking recognition of you know uh, the fact that you know these errors. Uh, can be commonplace, but you know we invite you to learn more. Uh, I'm so appreciative of uh, Menka, Brand, and ETL for you spending some time uh, with us uh, uh, in the center, and uh, we're just looking forward to continuing uh, the conversation uh, with all three of you. So thanks uh, for joining us today. Thanks uh, uh, to Thank the you. panelists, and uh, we hope that this will be the beginning of an opportunity for everyone uh, to learn more and uh, be able to affect uh, change and improve the science that we see in our criminal justice system. Mm -hmm.